Hey, everybody. Welcome to Cowboy Criminology. Of course, I'm your host, Derek Judd, the Cowboy Criminologist. Um, so I've gone back and forth on whether I wanted to, to cover this or not. Uh, yeah, you know what? Let's roll the dice. Let's do it. So Justin Timberlake of boy band fame. Britney Spears fame. Uh, yeah. Anyway. He was allegedly, or he was busted for, uh, for drunk driving in a very exclusive neighborhood. And he told the, he told the, uh, the police officer that he only had one martini. Okay, cool. But, According to the officer's notes, uh, Timberlake performed just abysmally bad on field sobriety tests and failed them all. And that's why he was arrested. Now, most of the time, for a first time drunk driving offense, most states consider it a, a low level misdemeanor, depending on what the uh, blood alcohol level is. In Texas, a first-time drunk driving offense is a Class B misdemeanor. A second drunk driving offense, <clears throat> it enhances from there, unless you have children in the vehicle under the age of 15, or your blood alcohol concentration comes back at 0.15 or higher, okay? So, just under twice the legal limit. And it becomes a Class A misdemeanor. And you know what? Interestingly enough, that's that's not even really the it's not even really the story. Um, the story is the outrage that people in this community are having. One because this officer had no idea who Justin Timberlake is, considering he hadn't even been born when Justin Timberlake was popular. And I guess there's a argument to be made that Justin Timberlake is still popular. Um, yeah, I don't know if I really, uh, I don't really fall in that camp. I've never, I've never cared for any of that trash anyway, but I want to share with you some of the things that have been said about the officer who, who stopped him. Now keep in mind, there's this whole thing about how nobody is above the law and everybody needs to be held accountable according to the law, regardless of their circumstances, uh, regardless of um, regardless of their social standing, one thing or another. But isn't it interesting how, depending on the level of poverty that somebody has or the level of superstardom somebody has, that gets thrown away. Now we we kind of beat that dead horse uh, when we were talking about Sandra Dor Dorley and being a prosecutor. She obviously wasn't immune to that, or shouldn't have been immune to that. I've got some concerns about that case. That doesn't seem to be progressing up the chain quite as quickly as as I would have thought it would. But uh, I want to share I want to share this with you. I want to show you the martini, the one martini that Justin Timberlake drank. So here we go. Justin Timberlake says he had only one drink the night he was busted for drunk driving. But it turns out the cocktail packs quite a punch. At the bar inside the Hamptons hotspot, the American Hotel, Timberlake reportedly ordered a $21 concoction called a Vesper Martini. And it's not for the faint of heart because it's a mix of vodka and gin, you're gonna have a good time. Unlike a traditional martini, which contains two and a half ounces of alcohol, a Vesper holds more than four ounces. The super strong cocktail was made famous by writer Ian Fleming in his first James Bond novel, Casino Royale. Mr. Bond. But it achieved a new level of popularity when Daniel Craig ordered it in the 2006 Great. movie version. Three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of Kina Lily, shake it over rice, and then add a thin slice of lemon peel. Yes, sir. You know, I'll have one of those. <laughs> so will I. To repeat, Three ounces gin, one ounce vodka, and a half ounce of wine aperitif, topped with a lemon rind. 
So why is it called a Vesper Martini? You know, that's not half bad. James Bond named it after the cunning double agent Vesper Lind. You know, I think I'll call that a Vesper. Because of the bitter aftertaste. Because once you've tasted it, that's all you want to drink. Here we go. Now for Ooh. a taste test. Mmm. It, it, it is strong. Something that Justin Timberlake now knows firsthand. Okay, so four ounces of alcohol. So just so you know, blood alcohol concentration is usually based on the idea of, of a given drink containing one ounce of, of, actual, of actual alcohol. And the human body can process, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The, body, the human body can normally process, on average, about one ounce of alcohol per hour, okay? And one drink is considered one regular cocktail containing two ounces of alcohol or less. Uh, one standard 16 ounce beer or one five ounce glass of wine. Okay, that is considered what most people consider would consider to be a drink. Now, this drink, depending on what he had to drink, what he had to eat, different things like that, his blood alcohol level could be significantly higher. But in the report, let me pull it up right quick. This is dated June 22nd, 2024. The New York Post says, and I quote, The rookie Sag Harbor cop who pulled over pop superstar Justin Timberlake for alleged drunk driving is well known in the ritzy town, according to a report. Officer Michael Arkinson, who turns 24 this month, stopped the sexy back singer Tuesday morning after allegedly seeing him blow a stop sign and swerve in the, li in the right room in the right lane. In just three months on the force, Arkansan has earned a reputation among Sag Harbor's wealthy residents, earning nicknames like Sag Harbor Nazi and Little Redheaded Dipshit. Classy. For his strict enforcement of traffic laws. Now, y'all, that is what rookie patrol officers are there for. They are there in order to enforce traffic laws. That's how they gain experience. They start doing what are considered everyday, every type, type task, traffic enforcement, uh, they respond to calls for service, things like that. But the, the interesting thing is, is the excuses that Justin Timberlake gave, you know, this is going to ruin my world tour. Um, this is going to, you know, um, what was it he said? I only had I only had one drink and I was following my friends home, basically implying, but you didn't stop them, you just stopped me. Trying to imply that he was targeted, which is hilarious because this officer had absolutely no clue who <laughs> this guy who Justin Timberlake is. But the the response I from the community, I just I can't wrap my mind around it. In Rochester, New York. Everybody was up in arms because Sandra Dorley was allowed to, was given preferential treatment. Yet, Justin Timberlake was shown no preferential treatment and was arrested, fair and impartial enforcement of the law. And people cannot stand the fact that he's out there doing his job. Now, is this a training issue? Is this a personnel issue? Well, it's not uncommon for young officers to go out and be proactive. It's the whole reason they got into doing the job. It's one of the, it's one of the best things about rookie officers. Does that need to be curtailed sometimes and guided into more productive avenues? It absolutely does. But if you tell them to go out and enforce the law, do it fairly, do it impartially, no special favors, no special treatment, you know, treat everybody the same way. Everybody needs to be held accountable under the law. Well, if you do that and then you let this officer be hung out to drive because you don't you don't want to stand up and say, hey, he's doing the job that he was hired to do. He's doing the job that he is paid to do. And there's there's nothing in there like that. 
but I think this I think this community has had a certain amount of autonomy from officers in the past, which which tends to happen. But I want you all to think about something different. All right. You've always got to think about the what ifs. So let's say this officer Arkinson had pulled Justin Timberlake over. And all of a sudden, he recognized who Justin Timberlake was, and he said, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to write you a warning. Hey, you need to be careful, what have you. Justin Timberlake goes out, runs another stop sign, kills a family of four. Everybody's going to be, it, it seems like law enforcement officers are in for it, and it doesn't matter if they do their job. They're over policing. If they don't do their job, they're nowhere to be found. And it seems like there's no happy minimum because people cannot just accept that law enforcement officers are going to be out there, I know, crazy, enforcing the law when they're not stuck in the back seat of their patrol car with a female arrestee. But different story. Uh, so y'all, y'all just think about that. I mean, there's a lot of different comparisons and contrast to the Sandra Dorley case. You know, you, you had an officer who wasn't going to be influenced by the flashy car and the fact that this person, you know, claims to be somebody. Um, I, th I, think, I think the feelings are hurt that, you know, how dare you not know who I am? But you know what? You, you made the decision. And... Certain bartenders are, are saying, or a bartender that served him the drink said, yeah, he, he only had one here, one martini with four ounces of alcohol. He only had that one martini here. If he drank somewhere else, it wasn't here. Well, yeah, of course he's going to say that because he don't want to get in trouble for over-serving somebody. All right. Those are, those are the consequences. And, you know, it just... It's it's an entire snowball effect, and it seems like the only buddy, the only person taking any accountability for their actions is the officer who did exactly what he was supposed to do. Anyway, let me know what you think about this in the in the comments section. Uh, I'm interested to hear how how do you think this stacks up against the Sandra Dorley case? Do you think it's do you think it's the same? Do you think it's different? Do you think the officer handled it right? Do you think he did it wrong? Let me know what you think. I'm Derek Judd for Cowboy Criminology. Y'all take care. We'll talk to you next time.